Well, good morning, Southgate Church. So glad you're gathering with us and uh, love having the people here this morning with us. It is such a great feeling to be able to worship together with other believers. And so I encourage you to be signing up for our Sunday morning live services. Uh, it's just a, a great feel. And of course, this morning is Thanksgiving. So just a shout out, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, you know, I hope you get to have turkey uh, because I am. I mean, I will, and uh, no, I don't know if we are not, but uh, it's great to have you with us, and again, you were reminded if if you want prayer at any time, that you would just uh, click on the prayer button, Uh, you know, if you feel like you want a response from someone, I would encourage you to do it. So this morning, we are finishing this series on Lighthouse, and uh, I hate the thought of finishing a series, it's kind of like... Okay, it's over. Now what? And uh, somehow, some way, I'm hoping that we can keep reminding you that this is not a five-week plan to encourage you. And I guess this is always my heart as a pastor is, um, are we really getting it? And, and is it becoming a part of our life rather than just like, oh, I got a few good things out of that. And yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dave, for that. And, uh, you know, whatever. Let's move on. What's next? And, and yet the scripture so clearly, the scripture we've been reading out of is in Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus says it, and I'm going to read it again. He says, you are the light of the world. That doesn't change after five weeks. That doesn't change because a series stops. You continue to be the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. So for five weeks, we've been trying to get you to light your lamp, don't put it under a basket now. That, I thought that, you know. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You know, when you look at lighthouses, lighthouses are placed in extremely dangerous places. The lighthouses are placed in in places where there's maybe a rough coastline and people can't navigate it or on a stormy night and you have lost your bearings and particularly in the days when there was no radar and, you know, sonar and all those things and they would rely on the lighthouses to guide them to their destination and guide them into the port or the harbor where they were going. And uh, so lighthouses were chosen for specific location, for specific needs, and it would guide the ships. And as we talk about this series, Lighthouse as a Church, that's kind of our thing. All of your houses are strategically placed in dangerous areas. You're in places where there is darkness around you, where there's not light, and you become that beacon of hope. You become that guiding light that can help other people. And uh, you can even be there. Lighthouses warned ships and people of of, uh, stormy hazards and local hazards. So that's what you're there for. But here's the thing. We've been talking about lighthouse. Uh, Your house really, itself, isn't the light. You you get that, right? It's not your house. You're the light. A lighthouse contains the light. And so I don't want you to mistake this like, okay, we'll light up. You know, I, I encouraged you last week to turn your lights on on your outside of your house. And, you know, some people said, well, how much is that going to cost? It's going to cost you between 5 and $10 for a month to leave your exterior lights on all day, all night. And I get it. People aren't going to drive by your house and say, oh, look, there's a lighthouse. They're not going to say that. But what they will do, what will happen, and it's been, I've been doing this now for the last week, is every time I drive in my driveway or I drive out, Uh, The lights are on, and it reminds me that I am a light. And Jesus has said, you are the light of the world. And even when I go to bed at night, the temptation to turn the lights off outside, and I leave them on, and it reminds me. So it might not be for your neighbors. It might be just to help remind you. Um, So I encourage you to do that for the month of October. And uh, I'm sure someone would come up with 10 bucks for you if you can't afford it. And I, I talked to some people, and if you're in an apartment, you can leave your deck light on. I don't think people would complain too much. You, there's ways. You can do it. 
Anyways, just a, an example, I've been asking for stories, and so we have a short video from uh, Madeline Kobilke, and I think this is a great inspiration of, of how God has led her in her community. Let's watch the video. Southgate, I wanted to share a vision that God gave me four years ago. Uh, we were looking for a place to move to, and we found a home in Alder Grove and ended up buying it. And I can't say I was super at peace about it, but shortly after we moved, God gave me a vision, and it was our street, and it was very dim, but our house was glowing. And I felt like God was saying, I want you here, you are supposed to be here, um, and I'm going to use you. And from that moment on, I was at peace about it. It has been amazing to see the opportunities that God has given us to be a light on this street. We've done things like neighborhood barbecues, um, to get to know more of the neighbors. We've made meals for people who've either had babies or have family emergency. We invited one of our neighbors to Life Group and now they're coming to Southgate and our Bible study. Um, also, we just have kids in our house and in our backyard all the time uh, just to um, play with our kids or we're babysitting them. Um, and then more recently, within the last year, we were involved with one of the families on our street and we have now become foster parents to their grandkids. So. Um, never would I have imagined how, what God had in store for us when we moved here, but I just want to encourage all of you to shine your light in your neighborhoods. Um, it's amazing what can be done through God and the relationships that can be made. Isn't that a great, great story? And, and you know what? We all have stories, and I would encourage you. All it takes is like a little two-minute video you can send me. I'd love to hear your stories. Simple as they might seem to you, they can be encouraging to others. Uh, it's interesting, Anne Frank says this, and uh, she says, Look at how a single candle can both defy and define the darkness. So as we conclude this series, I'm kind of jumping to a whole different passage, and uh, the first part of the passage I'm going to read this morning is, um, well, it's not super inspiring maybe, but more convicting, and then I'll kind of get to the, the key verse and key text that I want to talk about this morning, but let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful for your presence. We are so thankful, God, that your Holy Spirit is in us, that your Holy Spirit leads us and guides us, and we just say, Holy Spirit, we need you every day. And God, even this morning as I'm sharing the word, I pray, God, that your spirit would just connect things in our own hearts as we continue to grow in our faith and grow in our understanding that we might shine bright. Thank you for your word, God. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. And you're going to probably wonder, where in the heck are you going with this? But just stay with me. Um, Ephesians 5, 1 to 7 in the New Living says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on, fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do. So in that passage, you're thinking, wow, that's super exciting. Appreciate that. Uh, in this passage, Paul does not leave anything up for our imagination. In other words, there's no gray areas. You know how we always come to place and conclusion and say, well, you know, that's kind of a gray area. I want to suggest that in this passage, there are no gray areas. And I, I, I do have a point in all of this. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's very clear. It's black and white, if you might say that. It's dark 
and light. And uh, we often can read passages like that. We can read scripture and we have our own thoughts, our own opinions, and often we even have our own interpretations. And uh, I, as I read through this passage, I, I just realized there's not a lot to interpret. There's not a lot of symbolism. He just says it the way it is. And, uh, you know, so we look at it and, and sometimes... These teachings seem so harsh. It's like, okay, God, these rules. Why do we have these rules? And, and uh, it seems so extreme. Well, I just, I think we have to come to a place where we would actually trust God. And I know we, you know, we say Christianity isn't a bunch of rules, but Christianity does have boundaries for us to live within. And uh, so I encourage us to live within those because sometimes we would say, I'll be the one to determine if this is right or wrong. I'm smart enough. I can do this. I trust myself. And I, I think the point comes is, do we trust God to accept what he teaches in his word that it would become a part of our life and who we are? Now, I am going somewhere with this, but... Um, I have an illustration that I don't want you to be offended because I know we think certain things, but I have two pictures here to show you. And uh, these pictures are of the sunrise. And so you can see them very poorly taken on my camera. Uh, but, but I mean, we love, don't, isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. What you see, those are beautiful. And I, I just, I had this picture because I marvel all the time when I see the sunrise and I think of the great things and God's creation and, you know, the rich colors. Like, these co the colors don't even show on my camera. Uh, my son would tell me I need to get a Google phone, but that's beside the point. Um, and the mist. You know, you see the mist going right across the... Oh, it's just gorgeous. Well, I just realized that that isn't God's creation. What we see there is because of man's creation. Because God intended the sun to be a bright light. But through pollution and smog and smoke from fires, some caused by people, all of that changes what we see. And, and here's, I just have a simple point because I, I love this. I think it looks great. But it is also a reflection of what our atmosphere is like when the sun rises. Because what I long for, I love the warmth of the sun. I love the brilliance of the sun. And yet, you know, we're out there and we see this and we marvel at it. But the picture I felt the Lord show me was, it, is sometimes we think that living a colorful life makes us more attractive. I'll let that sing in. But the reality is the pure light of Jesus Christ shining through us, that's more attractive. When I say that, this passage, Paul goes through a bunch of things. You know, coarse joking, foolish talk, sexual immorality, all of those kinds of things. And I think sometimes, and, and I know even within the church and within Christianity, people live these colorful lives and they justify their reasons and have explanations and opinions and in their interpretations. I want to say to you this morning that I believe that Paul is absolutely clear what this is all about. And a colorful life is not more attractive. A pure light reflecting Jesus is more attractive. So I don't mean to ruin your picture and view of the sunrise and all of that, but I just, I felt the Lord just share that with me personally that, you know, it's not, it's, it's all the stuff in your life can discolor the actual pure light of Christ. Okay, now I want to get to my key text. Because this is, this is where the light is. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 to 14, Paul writes this, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. My message this morning is, live as people of light. I didn't come up with a creative subtitle. I just took what I read in the scripture. For this light within you, produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. And instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. 
but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. Eugene Peterson writes it in the message this way, you groped your way through the murk once, but no longer. You're out in the open now. The bright light of Christ makes your way plain. So no more stumbling around. Get on with it. The good, the right, the true. These are all the actions appropriate for the daylight hours and people of light. And you know, in Scripture, light is defined as life. In John 1, 4, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Light is life. And he talks further about darkness is present in the absence of light. Light has always been a symbol of holiness, goodness, knowledge, wisdom, grace, hope, God's revelation. Those are all of the things that light are. And those are all of the things as we're walking through this series that again, I want to speak into our lives. That we would be the people that reflect, sorry, reflect the true, genuine, pure light of Christ. that that the light we're reflecting is not discolored or colored with other things. Does that make sense to you? So in this passage, I'm just going to do three things, and then we're going to share in communion uh, today. But the first thought that Paul writes in the Scripture, his light produces what is good, right, and true. And in the word, in the Greek word, The word for good is literally benevolence or generosity. So think about this. Light in us, the light of Christ, produces generosity, a generous spirit, uh, an uprightness of heart and life and kindness. And you know, generosity is not always about money. You know, sometimes we think, okay, you know, church, let's be a generous church and and I think even in our vision 2020, we wanted to increase 20% in generosity, but that's not always a money thing. And, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking about this because, uh, you know, my daughter, to me, represents generosity. I hope I can do this. And these are things that people don't know, uh, but she's not a wealthy person. She's not giving money. But the one thing I know about Malin is that she's generous with her time and her gifts. She is what I would define as a generous servant, always considering others before herself, always uh, caring for others. To me, when Paul is writing this, light produces what is good, what is uh, benevolent, what is generous, a generous spirit. And you know, church, if I could say to you that generosity is not how much you give in the offering all the time. Of course we need, you know, to have regular giving so we can accomplish the things we're doing. And, and God blesses people that they can be financially generous. But as a church, are we a generous people? Do we have a generous spirit in how we give of our time? Dale and Cecile, I see them, they're here with us this morning, and they have a generous spirit. They give days and hours preparing meals for people in the community. I think of people that do that, they're not getting paid, they're not on salary. It's a generous spirit. And light produces a generous spirit. Light also produces righteousness. In other words, light should produce integrity, virtue, purity of life, uh, rightness, correct thinking. Um, You know, in, in a narrower sense, light should produce justice. And so as Christians, if we are literally shining the pure light of Christ, we should be people that, that live for what is just and what is right and true. And then the third one he says in that passage is, he says, light produces what is true. And this is not an intellectual thinking true. Uh, It's not something that, you know, you're trying to grasp truth with your mind. It's what, what would be translated a moral truth. Not only something that you know, but something that needs to be done. It makes us strong for us to do what we know to be true. And it's not hidden. Come on, light is not hidden. Church, I I said this before, but 
A lighthouse is there for a reason, placed in dangerous places. I remember um, uh, Lori uh, Kruger was praying this, you know, the fact that lighthouses are in dangerous places. Where you live or where you work could potentially be dangerous. When I say dangerous, it's not like, you know, people are going to kill you and everything, but, but the effects and the things and the darkness and the evil things that are around that can influence us we need to be the light that actually reveals that and shows and makes it visible, not the ones that just kind of join in and then our light gets discolored with everything that's around us. Just a thought. Light helps us know what pleases God. The second thing that Paul says in this passage is light exposes evil. All of our actions and motives must be tested in the light of Christ. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever examined things closely. Uh, as a matter of fact, this morning, I'm cleaning my glasses. And you know, when you clean your glasses and I'm looking and they look fine there. And then I, oh, then I hold them up to the light. And all of a sudden you see all the little things and scratches and everything there. I also, I have a credit card that is black and the numbers on it are black. And, you know, you take the credit card out and, and I could sit at my desk and, I, you know, somebody wants to know your credit card number and I'm, I think I can't even see it until you get the right reflection of light on it and all of a sudden it exposes all of the numbers on the card. Well, that's exactly what it's like in our life that, that uh, light exposes evil. And there's no question. I, I, don't, I don't think if, if you're even a, a, an unbeliever watching this and you don't believe in Jesus, you're not a Christian and you just kind of connected with us today for some reason, I don't think anybody would question the fact that in our world, there is evil. When we think of all of the stuff that goes on from terrorism to, to shootings to gangs, that you, like, it's all around us. Well, we can hide from it or we can expose it. And it's not like you have to go around pointing fingers and, sh oh, look at that, look at that, I see that. That's not it. If you are light, your being light and the light of Christ within you will automatically begin to expose that. You know the contrast when you see something light and dark, something good and evil, there's a, a distinct contrast. And that's what we're called to be in the world. A clear distinction. You know, black and white. It's clear, it's distinct. You know, you'll, you'll not confuse the two, if, if I could say it that way. And yet you can have shades of gray in between that could maybe be confused because eh, it's a little bit closer to black. But when you talk about black and white, it's like clearly there. And uh, it's just the simply of us making the choices uh, between good and bad, living in our life. Ephesians uh, 5.11, this is where I got this point from. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Unfortunately, I think as Christians, we've taken that to say, uh, don't take any part in worthless deeds and evil. Instead, judge them doesn't say that. And I, I just know that for us as the people that produce the fruit of goodness and righteousness and truth, that wherever we go, it will be exposed by virtue of who you are, the light of Christ. Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul writes this, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. And then John, I love this passage. The Bible says things so much better than me. <laughs> John 3, 19 to 21, he writes this. And the judgment is based on this. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light. For their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light. Have you ever experienced that in your life? You know, you're doing good, you're, you're living a righteous life and stuff, and people around you, they hate that. When I first got saved, I shared this a few weeks ago in my story, but when I first got saved, I, I have, I'm not bragging, I'm not, none of that, but of course, when you get saved, you're born again, your life changes, everything changes, and so you're different. And my buddy had some just choice, juicy words for who I was, because 
He wasn't. And he hated it. Just, it just is. Anyways. Uh, but those who do what is right come to the light so others can see what they are doing, what God wants. Great passage. Great passage. Light and darkness simply mean there's no ambiguity. We should know that as believers. And yet we still, when, if I went back to that passage and defined all of those different things, we still try to, our lives get colored with darkness. We let those things in. And the challenge in scripture is not to do that. And here's the last very obvious thought. Light makes everything visible. Uh, He writes this in Ephesians, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Wayne Dyer, uh, an author, writes this, you can't discover light by analyzing the dark. And then finally, Jesus says in John chapter 8, he spoke to the people and he said this, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. I have this one question for you this morning uh, as we worship with the phone. Um, Why, here's the question, why not dare yourself to become a shining positive light where darkness is the only thing known? You have to think about that. Why not dare yourself to become a shining, positive light where darkness is the only thing to know, be known? Which means we maybe need to hang out with people that don't know Jesus. We maybe need to be talking and conversing with people that don't know Jesus. We need to be that influence and that light that makes all things visible in that circumstance. This this whole series about Lighthouse, to me, this is what it's about. And if, if you were to go home and, and just read this passage, chapter 5 in Ephesians, verses 1 through 13, that it, just to continue to encourage us that as a church, we want to continue to be the light that Christ has called us to be and stated, you are the light of the world. Amen? Amen? Amen. We're going to uh, come to communion, so I'm going to invite the worship team up. And uh, just as they're coming, uh, you know, Jesus says to do this in remembrance of me. But as we partake in communion, um, we're going to do it to be thankful for him and who he is. And so um, as the worship team comes, we're just going to worship a little bit. And then I'm going to come back and my wife and I are going to share with you the cup and the bread. And... uh, We'll just talk a little bit more about what we're doing, but let's just focus our hearts now on Jesus, what he's done for us, and what he's asking of us.